Hi, it's Mike again with Ugtastic. I'm sitting down with James Edward Gray, who uh, is well known for Shades of Gray, the Ruby Rogues, and also uh, if you've used his faster CSV library in 1.8, and now it's part of the standard lib in Ruby 1.9. Not well, just Ruby 1.9. <laughs> um, but thanks for taking a, a moment to sit down, uh, James. I, I appreciate it. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved with Ruby? Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. I think I entered the community in summer of 2004 or something like that. And uh, I just kind of gotten off of a job and, uh, you know, go, went into that cycle of learning new things. And, uh, and I grabbed a copy of the programming Ruby and decided I'd teach myself a new language. And, uh, kind of got stuck and never left. What were you doing before Ruby? Um, I, I'm Java certified. I did that for several years. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a lot of time in the Perl community uh, working there. The, the project I came off of just before getting into the Ruby community was a big Perl site uh, mm -hmm. using CGI and all kinds of st uh, crazy stuff. So, so uh, you've, you've, you've kind of really embraced uh, uh, the Ruby community and it seems to have been a uh, uh, a lot of fun for you. What what was it about Ruby early on? Because um, two two thousand four was, I mean, it hadn't just come out, but that was pre Rails. Yeah, it was it was really early. Uh, it was easy to get hooked in the community back then. It was a very small, tight knit group of people. We had basically one mailing list where most of our communication happened, mm -hmm. and and you would literally be posting questions and getting answers from people like Dave Thomas and uh, stuff like that. So I, I was just on the tail end of that era, uh, oh. and and got kind of sucked in that way. Okay, and and then you created uh, the faster CSV library. What 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 drove that? It was an accident, actually. Oh. <laughs> they uh, they were talking on the Ruby Core mailing list about how uh, the CSV library was so slow, and and people were trying to analyze why it was slow. And uh, really, it, it it wasn't any particular fault of the library so much, just that it it did a lot of work in a really tight loop, calling a bunch of methods and stuff, which mm -hmm. in Ruby is pretty slow. And um, people were talking about ways to speed it up, and just a few weeks before that, I had read uh, Mastering Regular Expression or something like that. Right. And uh, it had uh, it had in the book, one of the major examples was a regex that parsed uh, CSV. Okay. And so I said, well, you can do it with one regular expression. And everybody's <laughs> like, no, you can't. And so I went and pulled it out of the book and uh, put it in the mailing list discussion and... and uh, a bunch of people threw really nasty examples at it that it didn't handle well. Uh, so I kept tweaking it and tweaking it to seeing if I could uh, get it to do all of it. And I wrote this kind of tiny parser using primarily that one expression and a few other things to handle some gnarly edge cases. And uh, that actually ended up being the faster CSV core for a long time. Eventually somebody came along and and uh, rewrote the parser not to use a regular expression, okay. but uh, but uh, that that was the start. Of it. Yeah, and then I mean, how what was the process that it went from being a or an external Ruby gem to being part of the standard lib? What did you have? Did you have to did you have to pay a fee? Did you have to <laughs> sign a license agreement with yeah with yeah Matt's? sign away sign away all <laughs> my uh, like no actually uh, um, there was discussion uh, once faster CSV have been around for a while. There was discussion multiple times about, you know, should we replace the library and the standard core? Um, and I, I think most people were positive to the idea mm -hmm. in that, you know, we wanted a faster library and stuff. It was faster CSV had a slightly different interface than uh, CSV. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, we didn't want to break backwards compatibility. And I had a compatibility mode where it would behave like CSV, but it wasn't perfect. There were some cases where it, it couldn't do the right thing. Um, so that was discussed for a long time, and nobody ever really came to a decision on that, and uh, which stalled it getting in. Uh, but then Greg Brown, a, a friend of mine, uh, kind of 
got tired of it not being in there and wrote a pretty impassioned plea to, uh, you know, this is ridiculous, we have a much better choice, can we just put it in? And they were decided, at that point, it was discussed one more time and it was decided, all right, compatibility be damned, we'll just switch over. Yeah, well, I remember upgrading from uh, uh, standard CSV to faster CSV and then migrating to 1.9 and had no problems. I mean, but then again, maybe our case wasn't that exotic. <laughs> well, one nine was uh, uh, actually kind of a hurdle because when I brought it in, one nine had the M seventeen N engine, right? So uh, it had to be reworked extensively because uh, because of encodings. Which encoding, you know, your data is in matters how you find things like a quote and a comma, right? right. Um, and so. Uh, Actually, CSV, the, the standard 1.9 library, was probably the first practical application of M17N. Uh, mm. And I basically had to figure out how all of that worked so that I could uh, rewrite the core of CSV to be aware of encoding. Oh, so that's, that's how your encoding article came to be? That's exactly right. Yeah. I had to figure all that out to, to port the library. Yeah, because that, that, actually that article was very helpful for me on more than one occasion. Just trying to figure out why uh, data was being uh, lost between uh, Rails, talking to Postgres, and back uh, in an earlier version of the gem. Um, but uh, yeah. we, actually, we actually drove some bug fixes in Ruby uh, at that time. When I was uh, fixing CSV, I would, I would figure out a lot of encoding stuff, and I would find some kind of bizarre edge cases and yeah. then post them to the list, and that actually ended up fixing certain bugs in Ruby. So. Oh, okay, so because you were you were actually driving a, a use case for a lot of these encoding issues, like putting in weird data, putting in foreign languages and different a variety of languages. So that that makes right. sense. Yeah, you, you were kind of uh, uh, burn-in testing the, uh, the uh, encoding engine. <laughs> Right. So the hardest thing when I was doing that is there was zero documentation. You know, the encoding was just a, a chunk of code that had been dumped into uh, into uh, Ruby, and I had to basically sit there and reverse engineer it and talk to certain people about what it did, and and that drove me crazy. So I wrote those articles that you mentioned on my blog. Yeah. And so you're jumping over to uh, um, some of the more uh, social aspects, not just the code, but uh, the Ruby Rogues. You're on there. You're you're a regular contributor to the Ruby Rogues uh, podcast. Uh, how did you get involved with that? Uh, I had had an idea uh, from some other podcasts I listened to that had panel discussions, and I thought, man, it'd be really cool to uh, do that in Ruby someday. And uh, I guess Chuck had had pretty much the same idea, and I can't remember who mentioned it first, but one of us. Uh, mentioned it on Twitter. Wouldn't it be cool to have a panel of uh, you know Ruby discussions and the other whichever one didn't mention it, the other one was like, I've been thinking the same thing, and yeah. so we uh, we kind of started trading some emails over it and put together the the original panel and just started doing it. And it was just something we did, you know, for fun in our spare time. And uh, but then it got popular uh, pretty quick, really, and. Uh, so we got lots of feedback, you know, your audio sucks and, you know, things <laughs> like that. And, yeah, uh, I, I, I hope eventually to get that kind of feedback. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> right, yeah. Because I'll be like, yeah, well, they all suck. Yeah, when you get a bunch of listeners, they they uh, they definitely bug you about it quick. So yeah. uh, we started we started fixing that and, um, and, you know, we had some people leave and some people come in and then we just kind of got lucky and... And getting a team that really gelled eventually, you know, and, and played well off of each other. And I think that's uh, mostly what led to its success. Yeah, I, I, I listened to quite a few. And uh, Ruby 5 and Ruby Rogues are two that I can, I can tolerate listening to um, in the background. <laughs> Because sometimes oh. it's almost like listening a little bit to like uh, I used to listen to talk radio and it, the banter. It's it's not too heavy, but um, you know you can kind of tune it out and just it's like a conversation in the background. Um, right. But it's it's a fun and uh, that kind of is going to provide my segue into the next uh, uh, topic. Is um, I, I joked with Avdi uh, when I interviewed him about what kind of was the impetus for me to reach out to him was listening to the episode 
And it was just this kind of banter you guys were having in the beginning of the show about stand-up chairs, stand-up desks. And I was like, I, I didn't, I didn't know at the time that you, you, you know, you uh, were in a wheelchair. And somebody said something about a stand-up desk, and and you said something like, "Oh, I don't use one," and I don't know who it said, but they're like, "Well, well why, James?" And you know, and then you guys all laughed, and. Um, uh, you know, and I said to Avi that that's you know that's a very uh, positive banter because you can't just have that one unless you guys were all friends and and, and knew each other well. Um, but it is uh, germane to um, the technical community and being out and speaking and going to user groups and conferences and and things like that. Uh, is, has that been something that? Uh, um, well, what has it been like? I, I, I hate that question, but what has it been like uh, going to conferences uh, in a wheelchair? Um, it's not, you know, it's it's not too bad. Um, there was some time early when I was first in the Ruby community. Uh, you know, it was a very small group, so I was probably the first one in a wheelchair in the mm-hmm. community. And um, there, just at that time... Uh, there wasn't awareness, and um, there, so they would just book conferences in certain locations without thinking about things like accessibility. Um, and there were a couple of early instances um, where some of the conferences were not in good accessible locations, um, and that wasn't anybody's fault. Like I said, it was just a lack of awareness, and when it was brought up, uh, you know, everybody felt terrible, and and um, all of that, but uh, being in the community pretty early on, that that made everybody kind of start putting it as a a bullet point on things you need to look for in a conference location, you know, and uh, so that that problem resolved itself really quickly, actually. And um, uh, really, the the harder part for me is just uh, it's it's not easy to travel with a big electric wheelchair. Uh, it, especially if you're going to take a plane, uh, it's right. very inconvenient. Um, so when I fly, I switch to a manual wheelchair, uh, which is much easier to get around with when you're flying, but at the same time, it reduces my mobility a lot. Um, so because of that, I just don't tend to go to a lot of faraway conferences mm-hmm. unless I make it a very special thing and, and do. So I, I tend to stick to the conferences around me, and I live basically right in the middle of the U.S., so uh, I usually do the, the more central conferences, and so I don't get out to some of the big ones on the coast very often, mm-hmm. though uh, Josh Susser keeps threatening to drag me to go <laughs> uh, And I would like to make it there someday. Um, mm-hmm. But every now and then I'll, I'll make a special exception. I um, went to Japan uh, for Ruby Kagi one time, uh, but when going there, then I was traveling internationally. So you had things like, uh, you know, how is the accessibility in Japan to consider? Uh, so I talked to Matt beforehand, and we had a discussion about it. And he, he told me it was really pretty good in Japan's modern cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to stay in the big, nice cities, but, you know, to avoid the uh, little towns, which right. is pretty similar to here in the U.S., actually. Yeah. Um so I stayed in big places like Kyoto and Tokyo uh, and, and did that. Uh, and then just recently, I, uh, this last year, I attended Aloha Ruby Comp. So I flew down to Hawaii and uh, oh. did that. And it was a great time. Yeah. I'm, uh, so it is something that you communicate to organizers. Hey, if you're going to have me come speak, just heads up. <laughs> well... Nowadays, I don't really have to do that anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, it seems to have just... It's something we think about now, and I, I've seen other people in wheelchairs at conferences now. So, you know, we're a big, sprawling, worldly community that needs to be aware of everybody's needs. So, And yeah. luckily, the good thing is, uh, you know, once you reach a certain point, we're a huge community. You know, RubyConf limits the attendance and, and still gets... 800 to 1,000, you know, so um, w- when you have to put that many people in a place, you typically need a, a very modern hotel or convention center, and those kinds of places are always accessible. Yeah, they, they've already got that handled. 
Right. That's so. yeah, because it, it is interesting that uh, I, as I'm doing these interviews, I'm learning more about um, people's experiences in a community that aren't necessarily. Uh, young white males, <laughs> right, you know, right. and, and, but even the young white male like yourself, uh, you know, there's, there's all different varieties of, uh, of, of ability and, and, and accessibility. Um, so it, it's kind of been interesting for me. I, I actually didn't come from the .NET. I mean, I came from a .NET community, uh, for 10 years and then started into Ruby, but in the, in the last few years, it seems like it has grown. There's, there's been some serious pains, um, with with isms in in the community, but it seems like we're coming out on the other side of that with a much more enlightened uh, community, or or the the birth pangs of an enlightened community, uh, and it's kind of interesting that it's not been something that's been enforced from the outside or a government mandate or some kind of regulation. It's been largely grassroots. The people in the community saying, "Hey, this is not acceptable," or "Hey, this has to be better." Um, yeah, I think that's really improving. I mean, like I said, I think now anybody who plans a Ruby conference is, you know, at least factors it into their thinking, you know, uh, it, it should be accessible. You know, I have people tell me things like, we'd love to get you to come out to our conference sometimes. Oh, and I've checked, there's a ramp to get on stage <laughs> or, you know, things yeah. like that. You know, so I think it's it's in people's minds now and they factor it into their thinking and, and just attending the conferences, I'm noticing how much more diverse they're getting, and and uh, that, that yeah, that makes me really proud of us as a community. Yeah. So, look, uh, you know, a lot of people in the Ruby community seem to be also. It it has hit a, at a certain stage where a lot of the it seems like a lot of the uh, earlier people who adopted it are now starting to look at other technologies. Is there anything for for James? Are you looking at Closure or 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 anything like that. I, I play with lots of uh, other things, you know. Uh, Erlang, I've played with quite a bit. I haven't got around to Closure or Scala yet, but they're on my list, um, you know, uh, uh, to get to eventually. Uh, actually, in, in in recent years, I've been more trying to um, focus on complementary things, like um, you know, a lot of people will go learn Closure and and you know use that a bunch. Uh, but I've been trying to do things like um, I actually sat down at one point and finally sat down and learned Bash, you know, the shell. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. uh, you know, uh, all those years I, I could use it a little but never really sat down and read through a book on it and, and learned how to write loops in it or yeah. things like that. And, uh, boy, I, that was phenomenal for my productivity. Like, yeah. I can't tell you how valuable it was actually I mean I understand now when a process forks what's going on you know and what are the rules and it's funny how much that helps and uh, so I, I've been learning more complimentary things I'm a big regular expression nut and I enjoy digging down into the guts of Onigurama and building really complicated regular expressions to understand how the engine works and uh, things. So I, I've been focusing more on complementary stuff and less on uh, totally, you know, I'm going to switch to this other language kind of stuff. So you're going to come up with a, uh, a Bash quiz book? or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think my Bash is that good. You need to talk to somebody like Wayne Siegwin for that. Uh, yeah. He's, he's, he's really great at that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I so just to kind of bring us to the tail end, uh, you've written a few books in uh, – but the one that was kind of the most interesting for me was the Ruby quiz. I've uh, I've only paged through it. I've not actually read it uh, formally. I've I've sat down and looked through it. But it was interesting that it was m more of like, um, here's some kind of neat things that maybe you wouldn't expect. And what what was the impetus for creating that book? Uh, so when I came to the Ruby community, I came from the Perl community. And about the only thing I missed from Pearl was uh, there, Pearl had Pearl's Quiz of the Week back then run by Mark Jason Dominus. And uh, it was a little different from the Ruby Quiz. It had like a, a beginner's level and then an expert level uh, each week and uh, stuff. But I really missed uh, doing that quiz and seeing all the solutions and uh, stuff like that. So uh, I created the Ruby quiz uh, to fill that void because I missed it. And um, uh, I ran it for quite a while. I can't 
remember how long. And um, uh, Dave Thomas at that time was, you know, really getting the pragmatic bookshelf going. And that was when they started producing a lot of Ruby books. And he came to me and said, would you like to take some of the best of the Ruby quizzes and turn them into a book? Uh, you know? Okay. So that was that was how it happened. He and he admitted at the time he's all you know it, it probably won't be a great seller, uh, you know, because it's kind of a niche thing mm -hmm. and and stuff. But he said that you know it's it, it's a neat topic and will be something fun to have in the lineup. So. Yeah, it's it was always on the shelves at any of the uh, consultancies I was at. Um, but it was it's one eight. Is there an update coming for one nine? Uh, no, they recently took that book out of print, so um. I think it's. I think it's all done. Uh, uh, I did the Ruby quiz for three years and then kind of set it aside. It was a huge time commitment because, uh, you know, you had to have problems ready to go and I wrote the problem each week. And then also I had to, as problems came in, I had to dig through the code enough that I could figure it out and talk about it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that took me some time and then, and then I wrote up the summary each week. So uh, all in all, it took me about eight hours a week, I would say, to uh, just run it and sometimes more, you know, oh, wow. if it was a complicated problem or something. So eventually I was like, uh, this is a lot of fun, but I'm going to have to <laughs> set this aside if I'm going to be able to do other things. Um, and there have been some people who've ran brief stints in the interim, but uh, nothing like the, the original run. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for taking the time to sit down and, and chat with me. Um, so thank you very much. You have a good day. Absolutely. Thanks.